breakfast that morning was a feast. A bit of the rice spoiled to a gruel and a cast-off earthenware pot served up in a bowl carved from a gourd. And Crane Man produced yet another surprise to add to the meal. Two chicken leg bones. No flesh remained on the arid bones, but the two friends cracked them open and worried away every scrap of marrow from inside. Afterward, Trio washed in the river and fetched a gourd of water for Crane Man, who never went into the river to help him. He hated getting his feet wet. Then Trio set about tidying up the area under the bridge. He took care to keep the place neat, for he disliked having to clear a space to sleep at the tired end of the day. Housekeeping complete, Trio left his companion and set off back up the road. This time, he did not zigzag between rubbish heaps, but strode purposefully toward a small house set apart from the others that occurred in the road. Trigger slowed as he neared the mud and wood structure. He tilted his head, listening, and grinned when the droning syllables of a song chant reached his ears. Master Potter Min was singing, which meant that it was a throwing day. Min's house backed onto the beginnings of the foothills and their brushy growth which gave way to pine-wooded mountains beyond. Trigger swung wide in the house. Under the deep eaves at the back, Min kept his potter's wheel. He was there now, his grey head bent over the wheel, chanting his wordless song. Trigger made his way cautiously to his favourite spot, behind a polonia tree, whose low branches kept him hidden from view. He peeped through the leaves and caught his breath in delight. Min was just beginning a new pot. Min threw a mass of clay the size of a cabbage onto the centre of the wheel. He picked it up and threw it again, threw it several times. After one last throw, he sat down and stared at the clay for a moment. Using his foot to spin the base of the wheel, he placed dampened hands on the slug of the lump, and for the hundredth time, Tree Ear watched the miracle. In only a few moments, the clay rose and fell, grew taller, then rounded down until it curved into perfect symmetry. Spinning slowly. The chant, too, died out and became a mutter of words that Tree Ear could not hear. Men sat up straight. He crossed his arms and leaned back a little, as if to see the bars from a distance. Turning the wheel slowly with his knee, he inspected the graceful shape for invisible faults. Then, ah, he shook his head and, in a single motion of disgust, scooped up the clay and slapped it back onto the wheel, whereupon it collapsed into an oafish lump again, as if the shape. Trigger opened his mouth to let out his breath silently, only then realizing that he had been keeping it back. To his eyes, the vase had been perfect, its width, half its height, its curves like those of a flower petal. Why, he wondered, and Min found it unworthy. What had he seen that so displeased him? Min never failed to reject his first attempt. Then he would repeat the whole process. This day, Trier was able to watch the clay rise and fall four times before Min was satisfied. Each of the four efforts had looked identical to Trier, but something about the four pleased Min. He took a length of twine and slipped it deftly under the vase to release it from the wheel, then placed the vase carefully on a tray to dry. As Trier crept away, he counted the days on his fingers. He knew the potter's routine well. It would be many days before another throwing day. The village of Chopo faced the sea, its back to the mountains and the river edging it like a neat sea. Its potters produced the delicate celadon ware that had achieved fame not only in Korea, but as far away as the court of the Chinese emperor. Chopo had become an important village for ceramics by virtue of both its location and its soil. On the shore of the Western Sea, it had access both to the easiest sea route northward and to plentiful trade with China. And the clay from the village pits contained exactly the right amount of iron to produce the exquisite grey-green colour of Celadon, so prized by collectors. Trier knew every potter in the village, but until recently he had known them only for their rubbish heaps. It was hard for him to believe that he had never taken the time to watch them at work before. In recent years, the pottery from the village kilns had gained great favour among those wealthy enough to buy pieces as gifts for both the royal court and the Buddhist temples and the potters have achieved new levels of prosperity. The pickings from their rubbish heaps have become richer in consequence, and for the first time, Trigia was able to forget about his stomach for a few hours each day. During those hours, it was Min he chose to watch most closely. The other potters, 
kept their wheels in small windowless shacks. But in the warm months, men preferred to work beneath the eaves behind this house, open to the breeze and the view of the mountains. Working without walls meant the men possessed great skill and the confidence to match it. Potters guarded their secrets jealously. A new shape for a teapot, a new inscribed design, these were things that the potters refused to reveal until a piece was ready to show to a buyer. Men did not seem to care about such secrecy. It was as if he were saying, go ahead, watch me, no matter, you will not be able to imitate my skill. It was true, and it was also the main reason that Trier loved watching me. His work was the finest in the region, perhaps even in the whole country. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.